This is exciting for me and fun. And I want to thank uh, the UN Association uh, and the Mid-Atlantic Conference for inviting me. And I want to thank Gillian for introducing me. It's a special thrill on many points. I hope all of you in the room have some shivers being in this chamber, because this is just one of the greatest places on the whole planet and one of the most important places. And all of you are sitting in seats where famous heads of state uh, gave uh, their speeches and deliberated on the world's greatest problems exactly where you are today. And I have the privilege of being at a podium where uh, some important words were uttered. And of course, uh, when Gillian introduces me, uh, I think to what I regard as the greatest words uttered in this chamber by President John F. Kennedy. Because as you know, Gillian uh, Sorensen's not only a great, great leader in her own right and a uh, major UN figure and now major leader of the UN Foundation, uh, her late husband, Theodore Sorensen, was the counselor to President John F. Kennedy and wrote some of the most beautiful words uh, and most important words about global peace that have been written uh, in recent uh, times. And so I'm a little excited, I have to say. Uh, and I also, I want to say something else. First, for all the people of my generation uh, that are uh, in the chamber today, I want to thank you because it means that for Many years you've been helping to make this strong relationship between the U.S. and the U.N. But especially for the young people in the chamber, uh, this is your time now. And it's absolutely vital for a generational uh, new lift of the American spirit for the United Nations to renovate, reinvigorate, create in new ways a link between the United States, the rest of the world, and this unique institution. There isn't an alternative to the UN. Either this works or the world fails. There just isn't a plan B. And so for young people here, this is really important for you and really important for you to get involved and really important for you to understand the things that this organization can do, is doing, should be doing, can be doing in the future. It's an evolving organization. It is uh, an institution that has to change with the times. It has to keep up with the times. It has to keep a little bit ahead of the times if it's going to play its role. And our times really are very complicated. And more and more of the problems come to the United Nations and need to be solved by the United Nations because they need to be solved by the world community together. We have an essential paradox. Actually, it is a paradox that was recognized by President John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address 50 years ago in uh, 1961 when he said, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. He was referring to the nuclear threat. Now we have the environmental threat as well. But what a paradox we live in and that we face because we can do absolutely miraculous things on the planet. We can end diseases. We can bring new technologies to the service of everybody on this planet. We can make the information age serve the information needs of the seven billion people on the planet. Or by thoughtlessness, recklessness, inertia, misunderstanding, short-sightedness, greed, and the sheer irrationality that unfortunately our species is uh, all too capable of, we can actually destroy the planet. 
not any other generation could say these things because that unique combination of ability to solve basic problems and ability to wreck everything is the modern and the uniquely modern phenomenon. And that's why what's being discussed among us today and what is the business of this chamber every day is essential. I think there are several characteristics of our world that Gillian referred to and that I want to reiterate that make our time very special and make the UN indispensable. <clears throat> it is a truism, but even though it's a truism, it also happens to be true in this case. So cliches are sometimes true. And this one is that we live in an interconnected world. You all know the butterfly effect where the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in one part of the world because of the uh, nonlinear interconnected dynamics of the world can set off a tornado or a hurricane in another part of the world. Uh, that's the kind of world we have right now. Every place is interconnected. Every crisis can spread. Every good idea can spread. We went from 11 million cell phones in 1990 to 6 billion mobile subscribers today. That's the good side of the world. And when you're out there with your phones tweeting, tweet away, uh, it's astounding how fast things can spread for the good. But we know that on the other hand, uh, what can spread for the bad is disease, uh, terror, uh, money laundering, uh, violence, forced migration, uh, devastation, environmental destruction. And so those interconnections are absolutely real. They're not a cliche. Second, the world is rapidly changing. I don't think there has been a time when change has come so fast. Technologies can spread almost overnight. You can go to the most remote villages of Africa, as I do frequently, now everybody has their mobiles. Soon everybody will have their smartphones. Uh, and this is something that five years ago didn't exist at all. Ideas spread, technologies diffuse, power is changing. The world economy is being rebalanced from what was a preserve of a few rich countries to a much, much wider prosperity. This is wonderful. The rapid growth of the emerging economies led by China is unprecedented in history, the pace that it's happening. China was about 2 percent of the world economy uh, in 1980. It's something around 11 percent of the world economy today, or about four, actually 12 to 14 percent. It will be uh, bigger than the U.S. economy shortly. Uh, and this is something that's happened uh, before our eyes, changing the world. It's changing geopolitics. Uh, there's a lot of good in this, in that the, it means the spread of well-being and prosperity is potential to reach everybody. But the world's also unprecedentedly crowded, of course. It's not just interconnected, but there are now 7 billion of us, according to the UN Population Division clock that's kept. The 7 billionth person arrived on October 31st, Halloween. Trick or treat. And what's stunning is that was just 12 years after the 6 billionth person had arrived. And because we're adding 75 to 80 billion, a million people per year, it's expected that the 8 billionth person will arrive around 2024. And the 9 billionth, 2044. And the 10th billionth, 10 billionth in the second half of the 21st century. Of course, these are trends they're not deterministic. It depends whether the ability to 
choose, whether women's rights, whether access to family planning services, whether girls' education takes hold because then people will choose to have smaller families, the population will stabilize, incomes will rise per person faster, environmental threats will diminish. But that all depends on empowering girls and women, enabling girls to stay in school, enabling uh, choice uh, to uh, be had everywhere about family size and access to contraception and family planning. The risks we face are extraordinary, unprecedented, not well understood, even scientifically only being glimpsed at for the first time in a way. When President Kennedy spoke about the power to abolish all forms of human life, he was referring mainly to the nuclear threat. Today, he would add the environmental risks that are profound. The fact that we're exceeding planetary boundaries in greenhouse gas emissions, in the destruction of biodiversity, in the loss and extinction of other forms of life, which are not only a horrendous moral failing, but a very practical risk for us in the food supplies and in the life support systems of the planet. In our country, half the people don't even believe in human-induced climate change. And that's not because they're dumb. It's because they're subjected to relentless corporate propaganda, day in, day out, by the big oil companies, by the big private interests that don't want the American people to know the truth. But the UN has taken a special responsibility to bring the world's leading scientists systematically to tell the truth. So it's truth versus Coke Industries. It's truth versus ExxonMobil. Uh, it's truth versus lots of money. Hands down, truth will win as long as we help to make sure that truth is told and that science is respected and that people hear the realities. And the fourth reality of our time is shared responsibility. There is a kind of myth among a small part of the American public opinion and American politics, a kind of uh, chest-beating nationalism uh, that says we can do it all ourselves, most powerful country in the world. I think we've seen what that kind of thinking gets us into the traps, the bleeding of lives and money uh, in useless wars, in huge mistakes, in the cost of arrogance and hubris. We are uh, a diminishing share of the world economy. We face uh, powerful actors around the world. We face global problems that we could never solve by ourselves. Even if the U.S. did everything right on climate change, and it's done very little right on climate change, almost nothing, but even if it did everything right, it wouldn't matter anymore if China and India and other major countries do not do their part. And so we face inherently shared responsibilities. We face inherently the need to sit down together and divvy up the responsibilities to say that there are global public goods that need to be shared. The U.S. isn't in a mood to do it by itself, couldn't even do it, sometimes says doesn't want to do anything anymore. It's feeling a little bit wounded by all these other competitors around. But the fact of the matter is this is exactly the place where this business needs to be accomplished. We have a wonderful Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. We've been blessed with some fabulous leaders of this organization. I've had the profound honor to work closely with two of them, the preceding Secretary General, Kofi Annan, uh, and the current Gen Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. These are outstanding global figures, 
outstanding statesmen, people who work round the clock, I can tell you, uh, basically relentlessly, day in, day out, every hour of the day to try to address a unbelievable range of global problems that all come through their office. And I have learned by being close by just how many problems there are, more than you can name. There are 193 member governments. They all have problems uh, that find their way to the Secretary General. Uh, and uh, so many conflicts, so many misunderstandings, so many changes in this crowded, rapidly changing, interconnected, stressed world. Secretary General put forward a powerful five-point set of priorities for his second term, which has started just at the beginning of this year. And we are very lucky to have him as Secretary General and to have this second term ahead. The five points that he emphasized are first, sustainable development. That means living together prosperously in a crowded world without destroying the planet in the process by overusing our natural resources or wrecking the climate. I do believe for young people here that sustainable development will be the great theme and challenge for your generation. It's inescapable to face the problem of how to combine the quest for economic improvement with sustainability of the world's core ecosystems. It's an unsolved problem. I teach it day in, day out at Columbia University, and I tell the students, I can't give you any answers. We've never been through this before. I can only help to understand what the problems are and what some pathways may be. Second priority, preventing and mitigating conflicts. Of course, this peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace conserving, conflict preventing role of the UN was a founding, foundational purpose for this institution. Third, building a world that is safer and more secure for all, that respects human rights, that lives up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the moral constitution of this organization and one of the greatest documents of our time. And I hope that all of you take time to read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, see what the world stands for in principle and forgets in practice so often, because building the reality of those rights for all is, again, one of the essential core tasks for each of us. Fourth on the Secretary General's agenda is supporting countries in transition. Transition of the Arab Spring, transition of countries moving to democracy and reform for the first time. Frankly, I believe all of our countries, including the United States, are in transition and need to be in transition. We need to be in transition to the new 21st century realities. The United States also needs a democratic overhaul uh, our politics are also broken in important ways. And I think uh, brave young people in Tahrir Square taught a lot to us and inspired the Occupy movement in the United States, a movement I strongly support and believe is also in the lead of a new progressive era for this country. So we're all countries in transition. Secretary General uh, has talked about how important the transition to democracy is. And the fifth pillar for the Secretary General's second term is to support youth and women to make sure that your role is fully recognized and fully empowered in society. And I don't need to tell young people here you're facing a very difficult economic situation, very difficult labor market, uh, new sets of challenges, but also I think the most exciting opportunities imaginable to build a world of the kind that can be built with the technologies, the ideas, the knowledge, 
the globalization, the social networks that you have at your hand. A couple months after that five-point agenda, the Secretary General specified some specific actions, and I just want to mention those briefly as well. He talked about ending the deaths from five diseases. What could be more thrilling? And if you're so inclined, I know of no professional discipline more thrilling than public health because you can really do things and you can really save lives and you can really have a huge effect at a massive scale. So we talked about our ability right now with technology and uh, proper planning and implementation to essentially end the deaths from malaria, polio, pediatric AIDS, meaning stopping the transmission of AIDS from mother to child, tetanus of newborns and mothers around uh, uh, unclean, unsafe childbirth, and measles. What a great practical agenda and how many millions of lives can be saved uh, in that process. Second is a move to a new set of global goals with the uh, acronym SDGs. This is very exciting for me because I'm the advisor on the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which are the goals to fight poverty, hunger, and disease adopted in this chamber in the year 2000. They will be in place till 2015. They've inspired huge action and huge progress. After 2015, the idea that is being discussed now and proposed is that we move from MDGs to SDGs. The SDGs would be goals that include finishing the work of the Millennium Development Goals to end extreme poverty everywhere and doing that in a context of protecting the planet. I'll come back to that in a moment. The third action ag agenda is to formulate a new social contract on work and opportunity to face the crisis of unemployment in the world. The fourth is practical actions to prevent conflict. And the fifth uh, action uh, agenda item that the Secretary General proposed on January 25th is to open a new nature preserve in Antarctica. Uh, and this is because it is a vital uh, frontier for environmental uh, preservation. Let me conclude by focusing on one piece of the agenda, my corner uh, of, of this as Special Advisor to the Secretary General, and that is the MDG-SDG agenda. I'm a big believer, as you might guess, in setting global goals. I'm an even bigger believer in setting bold global goals and then living up to them. That's even more fun. And what is, could be better than to set a high aspiration for your generation and then to actually do it? And I think the MDGs show that even in a noisy, crowded, divisive world where war and stupidity and so many things divert us, from the great things we could do to fight hunger, poverty, and disease, we made a lot of progress. And we're making a lot of progress. And so the notion is that when the world goes to the Rio Plus 20 Summit this June to honor, celebrate, and look forward 20 years after the Rio Environment Summit of 1992, that it will adopt the principles to move from MDGs to SDGs. I see four pillars for the SDGs. First, end extreme poverty. In other words, go take the progress we're making in the Millennium Development Goals and finish the work. I promise you this is completely practical. In fact, I give it to you as a homework assignment. <laughs> but you can work in groups, it's OK. And it's also open book. <laughs> And you have 15 years to complete it. <laughs> but it's a great, great thing to do. And that would be pillar number one. Pillar number two would be to face the environmental challenges, which unfortunately, because we're bursting at the seams, are so many. It's not only climate change. It's unsustainable agriculture. It's massive pollutants from nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, it's deforestation, 
uh, pollution, acidification of the oceans, destruction of marine ecosystems. There's a lot of work to do. And you can take that on. The third pillar is inclusion. The third pillar means that even if your GNP is high, what difference if there are people suffering within your society? We're not looking at the average wealth if it's divided between hugely rich and suffering poor. And we know in the United States the current realities. The rich ran off with the prize, and not in the most honest way often. And we need to get back to an inclusive society. And that's true of countries all over the world. We can't live in democracies that are really ruled by money votes rather than people votes. And we can't let these big super PACs run our democracy. That's not one person, one vote. If we have dollar votes rather than people votes, we won't make it. And so inclusive societies are crucial. And the fourth pillar to make all of this possible is governance. Governance that is honest, that is participatory, that is transparent, and that is worldwide and cooperative. And I think if we move to those four sustainable development pillars and adopt some specific goals for the period after 2015, it's going to give you a pretty exciting reason and possibility and direction to be involved and take on great challenges and help the world to live up to its need, responsibility, and capability. Dr. Sachs, thank you. Let me One end. more? Yes. Okay. Let and me end with but, the... But my question was, do, do we want people to ask I would love, questions? I would love for that, yes. Okay. I want to end with the two wonderful thoughts, again, coming back to President Kennedy, because I don't know anyone who had uh, more wonderful thoughts and ways of saying them. Uh, and thanks to his counselor and partner, Theodore Sorensen, as well. First, President Kennedy spoke most eloquently about living in diversity. That is our challenge. And what he said is astounding. He said, so let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. And President Kennedy said, in addition, in this chamber, in September 1963, at this podium, how we have responsibility to take this on. He had just come from the signing of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was the first agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union to get off the path of mutual and global destruction. And he came to this chamber and he told the people sitting in the very seats where you're sitting that we have a chance to save the world. And he said that the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, quote, can be a lever. And Archimedes, in explaining the principles of the lever, was said to have declared to his friends, give me a place where I can stand and I shall move the world. President Kennedy turned to the world leaders where you're sitting and he said, my fellow inhabitants of the world, let us take our stand here, here, in this assembly of nations, and let us see if we, in our time, can move the world to a just and lasting peace. Thank you very much.